Bam. Hello, this is Halleck Kohinski uh, speaking on the Break It Down show. Yes, that's right. We've got Halleck on here talking about her incredible book. You know, when we when we see the the World War II resistance portrayed, it's usually a person with a beret. They're riding a bike. Maybe there's some baguettes in a basket on their bike, or maybe they have you know black turtleneck sweaters on, and they're all resistancey and everything. And that's really kind of about where a lot of the common knowledge stops. Um, I read your book, and it's incredible all of the different people, the places, the the depth, the context of all these things. How did you fall in love with this incredible body of work and this story? Well, my previous book, The Eagle Unbowed, Poland and the Poles in the Second World War, contained a lot of resistance because the Poles resisted from the first day to the last day and had perhaps the best organized army, though not in fact the most effective because they never got sufficient weapons. And that made me curious to see how the Polish resistance compared to that in other countries, uh, which drew me into looking at every European country that was occupied by Germany and or Italy and seeing their responses. It became a much bigger project than I actually expected. Yeah, I mean, you've got a thousand pages of well-researched book here. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, so it, 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 I mean, it took me seven years. It was originally going to be a five-year project, but it grew to seven years uh, because of the quantity of material. Would you approach it differently, knowing now like what you had to do for that seven years? Like, would you have broken it into two volumes? Or, or I mean, once you get going, you're kind of going, right? Yeah. You are. I mean, right from the start, I decided to do it on a chronological format rather than the traditional one of country by country because mm. i felt country by country became first of all repetitious mm. and secondly you're dealing with the nationalism of each country that they were the first to do something they were the only country to do something and that wasn't the case mm. also i had a conversation with a, a former well a member of the former dutch resistance and i'd asked him what he did and he said well i trained people how to use sten guns I said, when did yeah. you get the Sten guns? 1943. What did you do before? And he had to pause and think. And of course, there was a, a lot of resistance apart from armed resistance. And mm. most people, when they hear the word resistance, assume it means armed resistance. But no, there's the underground press. That is the battle of the mind. It's very, very important. Um, intelligence gathering, saving allied soldiers. Mm. Um, all sorts of activities other than carrying weapons or blowing things up. The We have the benefit of hindsight and going, okay, well, this all works out in the end, but these folks in this time, they don't know that. I mean, we roll the dice again on that whole conflict and it could be that, that Germany does win. They do take Stalingrad and, and it goes in a completely different direction. So what were the mindsets of these people in the moment as they're living this life? Do they? Do they even know they're going to win? No, they didn't know. I mean, the, the initial reaction in most countries was to wait and see what would happen because the defeat had been so complete across Europe and really quite rapid um, as well in 1940. No one expected the French army to collapse. You know, it was the largest, most powerful army, and it, in six weeks it was over. Yeah. Um, I mean, the Poles began the resistance from the start, and that was the response to the German policies, um, that it was uh, the country was dismembered and, um, in effect, the population was enslaved. And so you mm. had to resist to survive. But in Western Europe, it, the occupation largely added an extra layer of administration. Mm. And the embarrassment of seeing all the Nazi banners and the people Germans strutting around in uniform, but you could live with it. Most people could live with it. Right. And so they waited to see what would happen. It was only from 1942 onwards when the true impact of um, the occupation fell on them as well as on Eastern Europe that the resistance began to grow. 
There's so many things to ask about the, but I want to, I want to uh, stick on the resistance side of things. So one of the things I've learned from, from combat is that day-to-day -day life for most people is um, very similar to day-to-day -day life for most people. So yes, you live in, you know, France and it's run by the, uh, the Nazis or you live in Holland or whatever it is. But for the most part, if you're in the right group, you know, not a whole lot different day to day thing. We have this sense that war is just complete and total, but it's really very segmented. I mean, even today, right now, there's a war in Ukraine, 500 miles away, an easy day's drive. There is not an, even a drop of war. Well, well, quite. And this is one thing that each country was separated from the other. So they had very, very little contact between each other. So they each had to develop their own response to the conditions in their country. And apart from Poland, every country had a collaborating regime or the civil service was running the country. And so they saw these people as a shield, I mean, particularly in France, because the figurehead was Marshal Pétain, the hero of Verdun. That actually slowed the development of the resistance because mm. people felt that they didn't want to go against what Pétain was saying. They, how they should behave. This is great. I, I love this because there's there's competing forms of resistance, right? And this is all throughout human history. You know, like you look at uh, the Americans, native tribes, there's the ones that are like, let's just go along and adapt. And then there's the ones that are like, we have to protect ourselves at all costs. So there must have been competing narratives constantly, like trust us, we know what we're doing. You know, we're connected on high or trust us if we just, you know, do whatever. And so... With the res when we say resistance, it's plural for sure. Oh, certainly. I mean, in in France, for instance, um, it was only when the forced labor decrees came in, which was the Germans asking the French, "Will you please round up your own population and send them to work for us?" Right. That brought the true impact of occupation into virtually everyone's home. Yeah, same, boy, that is interesting. Can you go, please continue. You know, at the same time, the Jews were being rounded up, but the resistance response to that, which I do devote a chapter to, it was really disapproval of how they were rounded up, not the fact that they were rounded up. Mm. Um, but but it was the forced labour thing that most people fled. They weren't necessarily going to fight, but they had to hide, and so the resistance had to become better organised in order to feed them. The uh, so when when people would flee to Iraq when I was there, um, you know, they'd be gone and someone else would just creep into their lives, may even take over their shop, their their business, whatever it was that they did. Because, again, these folks are betting that this is going to stick and this is going to be how it is. But there was a lot of. And so I'd walk around town talking to the people in town. There would be a lot of animosity and, and it's be a, a animus aimed at Bob, the guy who is now the cobbler in town. Because he moved into Muhammad's house, and Muhammad's gone, and his family's gone. But somewhere in in Syria or Jordan is Muhammad and his family, right? And so there's all of this uh, internal, this intra conflict within the populace that I witnessed. That must be the same thing for these guys, where like some people are trying to like, I'm just trying to survive. And and I want to bring the Jewish question back in too. Is if I'm there, I can absolutely wrap my head around going, oh, geez, the poor Jews. Thank God it's not me. And then moving on with my day, trying not to be noticed because getting noticed might get you notified or killed or whatever it was. Well, I mean, that's certainly true. I mean, people did go out for personal advantage. Uh, I mean, one thing that did surprise the Germans were the numbers of letters of denunciation of so and so is trading on the black market, so and so is suspicious for this reason, mm. that people being without being asked just volunteered this information because they wanted to take over a business or something like that. I mean, you get SOE agents, uh, some very important ones got caught simply because they were reported to the French police as suspected black, uh, black marketeers. Mm. Um, in another case, uh, one female courier was betrayed because the boyfriend of her organiser, the, the girlfriend of uh, her organiser resented having this pretty woman around, so betrayed her to make sure that she could get her man. <laughs> it's, uh, 
it's this is war though, right? This is the chaos of war when all of these things happen. There's jealousy, there's human nature. There's deceit. Yeah, it's human nature, right? Yeah. When when they're rounding up forced labor people, um, again, like that's you know, like Pierre has to go round up his neighbors and he's just trying to survive. What what is the legacy that these guys have? Do they have a sense for like, man, if this goes and that and we end up getting our country back, I'm gonna be screwed. Well, with forced labor, it was done by age groups so and organized by the Vichy regime. Um, but it was in the East, it was much more brutal. It was, you know, they, they would, the Germans would surround a group of apartment blocks and sort out everyone, anyone who was suitable for work, anyone who didn't have paperwork showing that mm. they weren't eligible to be taken. You know, they even took some swim bathers, uh, some sunbathers uh, away from the river, <laughs> just yeah. wearing their suits, were just taken away. You know, it, it became so dangerous to go out. No one knew if they would come home that day or whether, you know, their family would come home that day or they would have to wait a few weeks to receive a postcard saying, well, I'm now on a farm or in a factory somewhere in Germany. <laughs> Yeah, and again, it illustrates the point. You have people sunbathing during a war, you know, and so you're trying to manage regular life with this specter, this ominous thing that's there all the time. It's a, it's such a crazy, probably not even a dichotomy, a trichotomy, if you'll jump that far with me. There's so many things to keep track of. Well, I mean, people did manage to live normal lives. I mean, even people who were most active in the resistance, you know, remind us that people fell in love, they got married, they had children, yeah. people died of natural causes. It was not all to do with the war. Um, that, that There was the, this strata going on, and even people who gave, seemed to live normal lives during the day and might be distributing the underground press in the uh, night mm. would give a completely normal appearance. There were relatively few full-time resistors. Um, most people were just waiting to be called up or they were wouldn't even consider themselves in the resistance. It just happened that they had a barn where some weapons were being hidden. Right. Yeah. The joining, I mean, if you don't want to be bothered with this, if your life is continuing on fairly, you know, under, like it's not the best, but like I can just kind of muddle my way through. But then, um, and throughout the book, you talk about these different instances where, like, they took all they could stand and they couldn't stand anymore. And now they were going to be resistors because they had nothing left to lose. They're, they had been damaged in some way. Um, there also is that piece. There's this great line you have in the book. Where you, I think you're talking about the English side of things. When the, part of the pitch was, is we expect you to die, to be shot, to be captured, to be tortured. But you have five minutes to decide are you going to be in or out? And the person's like, I'm in. You know, so the, yeah. you have this decision point where, like, you don't want to have to do this thing. You may not even like the people in the resistance. You may not agree politically, but you reach a point of decision. And, and so, you, so you talk a little bit about that. Um, well, I mean, people joined f from different motivations. I mean, but some were so furious. Um, that they would do anything to get the Germans out. But a lot of people just fell into it by accident. It was, you know, mm. that being asked, you know, do you happen to have any men's clothing, um, which would lead then to hiding an allied airman right. and being part of the chain passing down to the Pyrenees? Um, or, you know, could you hide these documents? I mean, hiding people was the hardest because documents can destroy uh, messages, you can try and eat, um, but a person, <laughs> you can't hide. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that, that was different. Um, I mean, a lot of people wouldn't be able to put the point in which they joined the resistance. I mean, mm. I mean, famously, one was asked, well, you know, when did you join the French resistance? And just said, well, if I'd known there was a French resistance, then I would have joined. Yeah. You know, we can't see the resistance as some sort of association or club that you joined. You didn't. You were working with a relatively small group of friends who you could trust, um, you're allied to other groups who you hoped you could trust. And that built up to be what we call the resistance. But they didn't necessarily see that, see it that way. 
That's interesting. Yeah. The trust piece, and I, I'm really interested in this because you have uh, international trust, you have intra-governmental trust, inter like group, like all these different areas where you have to extend some very high risk trust, knowing that at some point for any reason, it could be compromised because it was such a challenging thing to, to keep hidden. And, and uh, you know, they're looking for you and, and maybe their attention is drawn somewhere else. But at some point, there is going to be a trail that leads to you or your decisions or your people or whatever it's going to be. Well, I mean, trust, you know, how the resistance started was just by people talking to, sounding out their friends or sounding out their factory mates or fellow members of a sports club. It was quite a common way of doing it and seeing their, judging their reaction. I mean, that could be risky. I mean, there's one example I use it in the book with um, a Dutch university fraternity. One member thought, well, I'm sure everyone else is indignant that the Germans have occupied our country and will want to resist only to find that some wanted to flee to England, some wanted to um, agree that, yes, they ought to do some form of resistance. Most wanted to do nothing at all. And one was later seen in the uniform of a Dutch Nazi. Mm. Yeah. Boy, that's so, crazy. That, 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 that was difficult to know. And also you just don't know that when someone's captured, how quickly they'll break down. Yeah. Because <laughs> it, yeah. Agent, agents were trained, but these people weren't. You know, they would think things through. They, they would talk about, you know, what to do uh, when they were arrested. But you, you can't predict anyone, even someone who's been trained, how they actually will respond under pressure. How did they respond under pressure? Well, some, some of them held out under torture. Um, some talked immediately even without the threat of torture. Uh, some committed suicide rather than risk breaking down. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Jean Moulin, who unified the French resistance, um, remained silent even though as he was tortured to death. Um, but with, with SOE, sometimes, um, you know, I do talk, talk about how they penetrated the French resistance there. And it was, you capture a couple of key people and one was so appalled about how much the Germans knew about the French section um, that he thought, well, there's no point in me holding out. I might as well talk. Um, another one who'd been very badly treated by the Vichy police was then kindly treated by the Germans. And sometimes treating people kindly makes them more susceptible to giving out information. Boy, and... it doesn't ever... <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. Let me ask a question here because you're right here. You're in my wheelhouse now, right on my spy side. Is is um, if I if, if I'm a German and I get my hands on a resistance guy, I'm going to tell the thugs to get away and let me talk to this person and befriend them because I'm going to try my damnedest to flip them and double or even possibly triple them depending on which side of the game I'm on. And turning someone into a double, even triple, even possibly a quadruple agent, right? Like you're just constantly flipping forth, back and forth. How much of that was going on where people would be turned and, and go against whichever party it was to include Germans against Germans? Well, some people would change because um, there was always the question that runs through my book is who is the enemy? Right. Yes. Because the obvious answer is the occupying Germans. But beneath them, you have the collaborators, um, you have other resistance groups. Mm -hmm. and that's particularly um, what caused some to turn is that um, the leader of the Polish resistance, um, General Stefan Grotroveshi, was betrayed by his closest colleagues because the Germans convinced them that the communists were a greater danger than the Germans were. And the same happened that took out virtually the whole Bordeaux region in France was again captures surely the communists are more dangerous. And that splits it. Suddenly you had your leader saying, look, we'll work with the Germans against the communists. And you think, well, what the hell's going on? You know, utter confusion. And yeah. 
you know, so, so that was a very common way of turning people um, or pretending to be an anti-Nazi. I mean, there's one particular character, Hugo Breicher, who in two different areas of France befriends people, convinces him he's an anti-Nazi, that, that he's an anti-Nazi German uh, um, officer and uh, wins their confidence, which he then betrays when, when it suits him. <laughs> This is uh, this is I mean, I, I've also got experience in Afghanistan, right? And you want to look, look at the, the classic uh, survivalist or turncoat, depending on how you look at it. Like those guys were always ready to to hedge a bet and do what was best for them to survive. And survival survival creates those kind of instincts. I'm curious about geography. I mean, the Balkans are wildly different geographically than, say, the Baltics. And so, um, if you want to go into Slovenia and trying to hold that territory, good luck. It is hard to work out there, right? And so how did that help the resistance, that change the nature of the resistance, whether you're in the lowlands of, of Holland or, you know, near the, uh, the Alps, how did geography impact the resistance? Well, it did, because, I mean, for instance, Holland is actually a very built-up country. So there were very few hiding places. So there was no real effort to build a secret army there. You know, mm. there weapons and everything, because there was nowhere for them to hide. Whereas in Yugoslavia, there were plenty of places they could head for the mountains. And in fact, you know, territorially, the resistance held quite a lot of the country. Um, but the Germans held all the um, important centers, um, all the major towns and cities, and all the main industrial resources. Yeah. Um, and mo also in Yugoslavia, the resistance spent most of the time fighting the communist resistance against the, the democratic resistance. They spent much more time fighting each other than they did uh, fighting the Germans. And the same in Greece. Um, there you have the Republican resistance that was in the mountains. And again, you have two uh, separate resistance groups, one communist, one not, who fight each other. But then there's very little resistance happening in the main cities because where do you hide? Right. Yeah. And they were also terrified of the communists. So there, were, there was more pro-German feeling or at least surviving, survival yeah. feeling. It, it is so complex to, to think about all of this. You're right, like you have this east and west divide. And uh, boy, it's 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 fascinating to to think about how one might operate in these environments. One of the things I'm really curious about is ultimately, and this is my assessment of how you're saying it. You look at the resistance as being just barely worth it. What makes it such a 50-50 proposition on what whether it was the resistance, you know, effective or not? Well. <clears throat> I think before we talk about effectiveness, please. I think the moral dimension is important mm. because you as an individual or I as an individual can decide I will resist so long as the risk only falls on the person who makes that decision. That yeah. is our right to make that decision. But what, by what right do you carry out an action, a piece of sabotage, disappear into the mountains and leave the poor villagers to be executed right. and their village burned in reprisal. And th yeah. this, this happened all over the Balkans and in Poland and the occupied Soviet Union, that the Germans would just wipe everyone out in the locality. It was only in 1944, after the D-Day invasion, that the same tactics began to be used in France as well. Mm. But people had, that, that did make people stop and think exactly what the impact of their actions were. Um, I think for the effectiveness, again, it's very difficult to do. The armed resistance probably was not as effective as it would have liked. Very few bits of territory were actually liberated and held um, after liberation by the resistance. It was the allies who had the far power. It was essential. Where they liberated, like the Paris uprising in, 19, in August 1944, succeeded only because Patton said to the French, OK, you can send some regiments to help. Yeah. Without that, it would have been crushed. 
whereas the Warsaw Uprising was crushed because the Soviets just said, oh, fine, <laughs> the Germans wiped them out. Yeah. Um, so, so, you know, you needed the Allies close at hand for mm. armed resistance to succeed. I think where the resistance was most successful, I mean, it was very important for intelligence, um, particularly on the V weapons. Um, and it it was important um, as well, useful in running escape lines. But the most important thing was it won the battle of the mind. Mm. It convinced people that this German occupation is not going to last forever. And that could mean, you know, choose to join us, or it could mean don't collaborate because we know who you are. And when the war's over, you will pay for your crimes. Yeah. When you think about resistance, you know, we have a couple of models that work really well, at least on, on the scale that they could. So you have um, the American army during the Civil War going out and uh, binding up uh, the ability of the South to move things via rail, taking a rail line out and and you know, you know, bending the rail line so like you couldn't you couldn't put that rail down right there. You had to go and repair that, and that just takes an enormous amount of time. And you're probably losing trains in the process. Same thing with uh, uh, with Lawrence out in the desert. You know, just you, a little bit of explosive, and and your your train is going to have to stop and deal with that. And this is uh, impactful to to whoever the army is. However. Uh, Lawrence is in the middle of the desert in Arabia. Not a lot, not a lot of people around, and also, you know, the the army of the north is taking on the army of the south. They're an army, and they hold that land. If you're a resistance fighter who's yeah off in Bordeaux somewhere blowing up train tracks, someone's paying the cost for that, and they're right there in that village. Yes, yes, I I, I mean that you know that that's true. So the communists were much more willing to r risk innocent deaths mm. they saw it as a recruitment tool if people's villages were destroyed then the only people who could supply them with the war with, with food would be the partisans mm. and they would have to follow the partisans um the democratic resistance were just thinking well hold on you know no one's going to like us if there's there's going to be high casualties you know so we have to consider what we're what we're doing um, but, you know, as, as the Germans became more and more desperate and more brutal, it, it made no difference at all because the, the, the Germans had, had took very little excuse in order to wipe things out. I mean, after all, the massacre of, at uh, Orador sur Glan, which brought the full impact of German reprisal policy to France in June 44, happened because one officer went missing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, the randomness, it, yeah. It was as simple as that. The uh, so one of the aspects that I find fascinating too is the um, preference towards or against ethnicity. Obviously, there's the Jewish action, but there's um, you know the the familiarity with the Nordic people and how they get treated in terms of uh, Nazi treatment and governing and everything else, as well as the the resistance. Can you talk a little bit about the, you know, the more friendly uh, ethnical or ethnic alliance and the uh, the more combative ethnic alliances? Well, I, th I think you have to be a little careful because in Norway, for instance, the Nordic, the, you know, being Nordic race, they were admired by the Germans, um, and there you had the resistance acting against Quisling, the collaborator, as well as against the Germans. Um, with Holland and with the Flemings in Belgium, yes, the, the Germans would very much like them on their side and the Baltic states, you know, these all form legions, um, the anti-communist legions that, that would fight alongside the Germans. And certainly their ethnic was affected the brutality in the East, in Poland and, East, and the occupied Soviet Union, you know, German soldiers could do what they liked. They would not be told off if they shot a hundred people. It was quite acceptable. Whereas the same when the communists first shot some um, uh, Germans in France, and the penalty should have been fifty Frenchmen for every German. The, the German, uh, the senior Germans were saying to Berlin, "We don't need to do that. 
we can keep control of the situation. We don't need to provoke people by such severe reprisals. Right. Um, but in the East and the Balkans, they just didn't care. But even in the Balkans, they did have some live and let live deals with both resistance groups. It's, um, uh, it's mind blowing how big and complex this thing is. Again, you go back to this East West conflict, you know, where, hey, uh, we don't like the Nazis, but gosh, and I, I'm, I'm going to put some future point of view on this. Gosh, the Americans are going to come and we're going to win this thing. So I, I'm curious when the resistance movements at all are looking at their situation when the russians defeat the nazis in stalingrad yeah, that wasn't a given and and even d-day being successful i mean eisenhower writes a letter saying hey this didn't work and it's on me right so was there either of those things or was it something else that made the resistance say now is the time when we dig in and does it change our point of view of we're digging in and the nazis are less of a problem now now it's it's the russians well um Two things that with with also starting as the Germans as the Soviets start advancing east. I, I have a whole lengthy chapter about the sort of um, curve of countries right from the Baltic states down to to the Balkans of the responses that these countries had to do. That now they were going to lose the German occupiers, but they faced a new occupation from the Soviets, mm -hmm. and they knew that, but they couldn't convince the West. They were all appealing to the West, you know, will you please send missions to observe what's going on? Um, will you please talk to the Soviets and say, stop killing our people? Um, the West just didn't want to believe because they knew, basically, it was the, the Soviet soldiers who were winning the war much more than the D-Day advance. That was, a, in a sense, D-Day was a political decision as well as military that, that you needed to have an allied, Western allied presence in Europe. Um, with the resistance response to D-Day, I mean, that was that the, the French resistance was now supposedly under allied command. So when the messages went out, rise up, they did. But when control, command and control immediately broke down because um, they decided to call out the resistance throughout France and, of course, got stuck in Normandy. So a week after D-Day, they sort of say, um, well, those of you in the South, we're not invading in the South yet. Will you please go back home? Well, they couldn't. Once mm. they were out in the open, they had to stay out in the open. And this is when the Allied orders begin to be uh, not so much disobeyed or ignored. You know, they would be obeyed if you could get more weapons dropping from the sky. Yes, they would play lip service uh, of loyalty to you. But otherwise they would go and pursue their own goals, which could be the liberation of territory, like the attempt to liberate Vercor, the plateau of Vercor, expecting Allied help and not receiving it, mm -hmm. and, and learning from the massacre, or trying to take towns when they were too weak um, and then suffering heavy losses. But they didn't always pay it. I mean, they, 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 they wanted to help their allies, and they certainly worked well as guides, um, and they blew up everything in southern France, um, you know, which is why the Americans could advance very, very quickly once they did um, land in the south, um, because the, the French resistance had prepared the, the ground for them. And also, you have to remember, because the German army was already retreating. Mm. The war was mostly in the east, when, it, when you had all these countries facing this new occupation and working out what to do. And I, the example I normally give is Hitler's former satellites, Romania, Hungary, and Bulgaria. They all wanted to switch sides, but they wanted to retain their independence. Hungary jumped too quickly and was occupied by the Germans. Bulgaria jumped too late and was occupied by the Soviets, and it was an occupation. Romania timed it to perfection, just as the Soviets were entering Sofia, the, the um, the uh, Bucharest, the um, Romanians rose up. It made no difference at all. It was a Soviet occupation. There's <laughs> so much to ask about. We also haven't talked about uh, U.S. occupation. You know, when you when you look at this, uh, sure, the Russians come forward, and and all these countries are now ultimately under the Iron Curtain at some point. 
but the Americans, heck, we're still in Italy. You know, we got we got bases all over the place, but we have managed to maybe sidestep the occupation thing. So, so how did the Americans deal with any counter resistance towards their presence? I don't think that there was much of a problem again against okay. the, the British or American allies. I, th I think that it, it was accepted. Certainly, some the communists hid some of the weapons for the later war once the. Allies had gone back home again. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a problem in Belgium that um, they said, okay, now we're going to, because the Allies advanced so fast through Belgium that the Belgian resistance actually had remarkably little to do. And so you had all these people who had been proudly prepared to do some rise up and then nothing to do. And so when they were told, well, you know, thank you, you've done your job, um, hand back your weapons and go home. There, were, there was quite a fuss about that. They sort of, in a sense, wanted more acknowledgement. And also the Belgian government that had just returned was not popular. Right. Yeah. Well, this is the other thing, right? You get all these experienced, seasoned, angry people, and uh, you're trying to hold a, a government together. And you have a lot of contrary people out there, especially if, you know, the partisans win or the Democratic, you know, the whatever it's going to be, there's a lot of conflict left to be kind of sussed out and hopefully, you know, drained of, of conflict. But how how did they manage that? Um, differently in different countries. Obviously, in Eastern Europe, it was a communist takeover. Right. So the resistance there was, in effect, defeated, um, with the exception of Greece, where that was on British guns. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's uh, the democratic government was restored. Um, but uh, the best solution, I think, was probably in Denmark. The first post-war cabinet was half of um, the National Resistance Council and half of the pre-war politicians. And that didn't last for very long, but it was an acknowledgement that, you know, we pay tribute to you, you need to share rebuilding the country. And certainly a lot of, a lot of countries did adopt that solution. Um, there was more controversy in France because de Gaulle just sort of said, well, I'm bringing my own people. And the resistance very felt, felt cheated. Mm. You know, they didn't feel that, that he had acknowledged their contribution sufficiently. Um, and you know, particularly his, his uh, behavior in Paris when he didn't, uh, and the march through Paris when they said, but we had, resistance leaders should be leading the parade and it was no it was french troops um that that did did cause resentment mm. um but a, a lot of it has actually depended on how fast the incoming government was going to deal with the collaborators because they needed to get control quickly because what happened in france with the sort of savage um reprisals that that happened against not just collaborators but basically anyone you didn't like mm. um you know was, was terrible in italy which after all had had a, a long period of fascist rule um even the allies just sort of said okay we, we won't quite we won't pay attention to what you're doing now um we'll give you an am amnesty that you can do what you like now against your collaborators and that actually helped things settle down because you got the first rage over. But you needed to have trials of the main culprits. Um, and those happened in the post-war years. Um, and I think that helped settle things down considerably. And also sheer war weariness. People just wanted uh, to get back to their normal lives. Yeah. What... Um... When we see movies and the resistance is portrayed, there's always, you know, strong women in that role. But from my experience, again, in, in combat, a lot of times women are most powerful when they're able to simply be in a room serving tea and listening or being ignored that they're even there. So there's all kinds of roles women can play that aren't portrayed in our, our art and our culture. So I'm, I guess I'm asking you is, is how did women do, I mean, it's great to have a woman carrying a big old heavy gun, but I'd rather her do something that she's great at and built for. Is, is kind of how I would approach this. So, what was the success? What was the roles? How did women integrate into this fight? 
Well, they played a very important role, not in the armed resistance. Very mm. few of them carried weapons. But they played them, they were the auxiliaries, if you like. They were the ones who would transport papers to people in hiding, uh, move people from one hiding place to another. They would hide weapons and move them as well. They worked very much in the underground press. Because mm -hmm. you have to remember, first of all, a number of the men were away as prisoners of war. Not all of them were released uh, by the mm -hmm. Germans. And so women had to do a lot more because also the men had to prove they weren't eligible for forced labor and things. Women had much more freedom of movement and they actually relished that power um, of being able to move around and to do something mm -hmm. to help their country. There, there probably were some who also just thought you know, the men lost the war. We're, we're, we will <laughs> keep the society together. Um, while they are away. Um, and certainly, you know, France, the women didn't have the vote before um, the war, and they got the vote soon afterwards. Yeah, I mean, women did remain in, in power, and the same in Italy, the women got a great sense of power, from, empowerment from, from yeah. the, in the resistance. If you were going to drop a character of a really, like, the the best among the best of the female resistors what does that person look like what do they do day to day in the resistance um i think the, the most some of the more, most admirable ones were the ones who worked on the escape lines because mm -hmm. those were penetrated by the germans time and time again and they they rebuilt it um and that was you know men may have headed them but it was the women who did the, the hard work moving the thing. Also, uh, I mean, ex excellent and active um, intelligence network in France. Alliance mm. was run, effectively run by Marie Madeleine Foucard. Um, and it, again, networks would be penetrated. You know, and she would just re report um, back, right, Bordeaux's collapsed, Marseille's collapsed, uh, rebuilding now. Um, and networks were they would restore networks um, and keep the intelligence flowing to the allies. It's it's remarkable all of the things. <laughs> Just like you continue to be blown away by the size and scope of this work. How much of your source material was um, you know in Dutch, in Flemish, in French? other languages, because that often gives you a different point of view as opposed to whatever the West might write. And I'm talking about Western countries as well, but when it's written in that home language, how much of that stuff were you able to put into the book? Ah, um, I think I counted that I would need to do you no know, 22 languages. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know even the best linguists who know 22 languages. Right. So I could I could read books in French and I could read books in Polish but otherwise I had to rely on those which had been translated unfortunately yeah. you know stuff had been translated from every country so um you know I, I, I could I could do that and yes one had to be sometimes careful about certain bias but I mean even with stuff translated you you had to be careful about bias because after all what had been formally behind these the iron curtain they could only talk about the communist resistance and had to, had to ignore actually the people who, who really had uh, been resisting um, because of their governments. And is it, they're still sorting, Eastern Europe is still sorting out its history even yeah. now. Yeah, you think about like the impact, you know, and the things, the moments that changed all of history in this one little, you know, this person gets killed or, you know, by happenstance, this happens or whatever it is. Someone gets mad at a boy they want to get for a husband. And so there's there's deceit and sudden changes. There must be dozens of times where that's a major turning point in this resistance is their success or whatever. Or maybe it's the other direction where the, the resistance pull off this long shot operation. And it, it from that point forward, the Nazis influence goes down. What stands out in terms of like, wow, this one point here, that changed a lot of things? Um, well, very few single acts. It, it was a lot of it was the, the repetition, the blow, constant mm -hmm. blowing up of the railways, 
the constant sabotage of the factories. It was very much that the resistance was unpredictable that mm. unsettled the Germans. I mean, you did have some spectacular operations, um, and I talk about three, the assassination of Heydrich um, by Czech agents parachuted in. I mean, that actually destroyed the Czech resistance, which was very small to begin with, because although the Czechs were Slavs, the Germans treated them quite well because they needed the armament factories to remain running. Mm. Um, but that that's because it was work with the massacres uh, literature was well publicized. That showed people what the Germans were capable of. Um, so it was important from that point of view. I mean, the same with the blowing up of the Gorgo Potamus um, fire duct in Greece is it showed people there was a Greek resistance. Yeah. Um, which many people didn't know what was going on in the mountains. And, and so that broadcast it. And of course, it also brought the British into contact with, with the Greek resistance. The one that was probably the most important was the sabotage of the heavy water factory in Norway. Yeah. Yeah. But no one knew how seriously the Germans were pursuing the atomic program. They certainly knew that in Heisenberg, they had a theoretical physicist who was capable of um, developing a nuclear bomb, but they did not know what was, what was going on. And they knew that heavy water was um, important for the Germans. Uh, so taking that out, and again, that brought in the moral dimension because the last heavy water was being taken on a civilian ferry across a lake, and they had to make that decision to kill the civilians on the ferry in order to sink the, the last barrels of heavy water. Yeah. It's, you know, in, to even come up with the concept of where is there access to heavy water? Is this important? Do we have the capability? And then can, can you actually pull off the mission? That, that is such a tiny, tiny, tiny piece of the puzzle, an important one. But to, to think about all of the things, the instances where you have to cripple this capability and that's the place where you do it and you're going to have to kill everybody on a boat. You know, that's, it's remarkable that this stuff all played out in a way that we ended up here where we are now. How easily could this have all gone way worse or way better with the resistance? Um, well, way better if they had more weapons, particularly for the Polish resistance. Had, had mm -hmm. they received more parachute drops and more weapons, they would have been able to do a lot more, and they were willing to do a lot more. They, they were only stymied by the lack of weapons. I mean, after the Warsaw Uprising and the lack of support from mm -hmm. outside and the Soviet behavior, the Polish resistance did collapse quite quickly, mm -hmm. um, although a nucleus was being formed of the future anti-Soviet resistance, which, of course, then also got crushed eventually in the years after the war. Um, I mean, so more weapons would have helped. I think also the railway sabotage, particularly in France, would have been more effective if they had realised earlier than they did um, that there were only six cranes in France capable of lifting a locomotive. Okay, wow, yeah. Tracks. So if you keep the railways blown up to trap those cranes, then you can easily block all the other lines by just blowing up a single train and tipping over a locomotive, and they can't pick it up. Um, and that, that they only realised that really in the last months of the war, that, yes, yeah. that you you could take out the take out those cranes, and that stopped the railways. That is fascinating because this is like the other side of the heavy water thing. Like, hey, if we had identified this earlier, you know, maybe they do something to deal with it. But that's yeah, that's that's brilliant to to think about. I don't. I can take out all the trains, <laughs> just making all these engines just being on the ground. It's yeah, that is crazy. Okay, so I I want to go back to the um, the communication and trust part of this. This is a gigantic organization, but it's super fractured and you have to talk across things and we don't have encryption. Okay, look, we have we have cryptography, but we don't have like, I can talk in the open on a radio and only a person who knows my, you know, they don't have that kind of communication. So a lot of it's by foot, by horse, by airdrop. Um, 
how in the world did these people trust anything they were told? I can't imagine that they reliably trusted anything. No, they, they appeared to, you know, okay. with, with the radio things. I mean, of course, there were tragedies that uh, when the radio operators and, the, and their radios and their codes were caught by the Germans and the Germans right. played them back and the Allies just thought, well, that message seems a bit garbled, um, but I'm sure it's OK. And it wasn't. Mm. Um, and there's, I mean, the, the tragedy with the Dutch resistance is one radio operator who was captured and was um, persuaded to use his radio would tell tell them, you know, I, as clearly as he could, like ending messages with C A U and the next one G H T, uh, uh, and London missed it. Ah, uh, right. And so over fifty agents, and I can't remember the the quantity of yeah. supplies was dropped straight into German hands. Yeah. And in oh. fact, I mean, one reason that the British finally realised something wrong was going wrong was all of the radio messages coming from the Netherlands were straightforward to um, take down and decode, whereas others, they'd always, you know, they'd missed a group of letters and they had to guess or um, you know, adopt different ways of breaking down what the message was. Never a problem with the Dutch ones because yeah. they were by the Germans. Uh, so, you know, um, so, you know, the trust in London to realize that was a problem um, did fall. I mean, certainly in the Netherlands. And certainly in parts of France, that the, you know, they just did not know who who to believe. But you know, trusting the people next to you or the people in the network um, up the road from you is yes, that remains. Um, you know, I suppose because it had to. How mm. are you going to prove um, people were traitors? Yeah. Um, you know, so sometimes they could. Some people would be suspicious of one person, and another one would say, "Well, no, he's okay." But who knew? Until and some people just look suspicious. They show up and you're like, mm, you know, just because of the way their their faces or their their physical movement, some people just present untrustworthiness, even, even though they're maybe completely reliable. You know, it's all perception in so many ways. Well, I mean, then you have the mystery of certain characters like Derek Hall in France, who allowed the Germans to read all their SOE traffic. That yeah. He organizing the the flights to and from France um, allowed some agents to land and go about their business and turned others over to the Germans totally unpredictable Wow yeah it's uh, it's also interesting to think about like the, the higher command trying to communicate with someone on the ground and, and these two share a completely different reality I experienced a lot of this where the ground truth informed me on where to be, where to go, who to talk to. And, and some person who's a thousand miles away has no idea what it's like to be me day in, day out. And so they're advising and tasking me to do things. And I'm like, what on earth are you talking about? You know, and we can't have a conversation because it's, there's no point in that. So it must be that, I don't know, whatever SOE agents or whoever it's going to be that's on the ground, OSS agents, all these different institutions, like if you, you just have to trust that, Alan Dulles knows where to go or what to do. And all of these different names, there's people that become truly great at this and not everybody is. To be able to allow them to be great means letting them do what they need to do. How much control did the top have over the bottom? Um, not so, I mean, I gave the example of when the French resistance was called out. But I mean, you, you, you had that again in Italy with, when they realized they were not going to break into northern Italy across the Appenine lines yeah. um, in the winter of 1944 to 5. So they tell the resistance in northern Italy, well, we can't do anything to help you during the winter, go back mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. And the resistance basically just said, we're up yours, we'll carry on doing what we want to. Yeah. Um, at the, the same time period, um, the British have to land with the royalist government in Greece in order to install the royalist government that they'd supported. 
uh, despite the fact that most of the resistance had been Republican. And indeed, by Christmas 1944, um, the communist resistance is attempting to enter Athens and overthrow the government. And it's only British weapons um, that are keeping it at bay until the communists actually also realize they're not being supported by Stalin. And so they stop. But I mean, this was the end of round two of the civil war, round one having taken place while the Germans were in occupation. And yeah. round three, the, the Greek civil war was much more vicious and long lasting afterwards. Yeah. And we don't think about these multi-generational conflicts where, you, you know, the, they're, they're still fighting to do internally. Um, I do want to ask you before we run out of time, you, you have so much knowledge of the Polish resistance and you always think of the Poles are just like ready to go. If it involves killing Russians, every Pole is going to raise their hand and be like, yes, you know, and if it involves getting the Germans out, is this, is their ferocity because they are like, hey, we don't have a Poland right now. We're not Prussia, we're Polish. And we want to have this part of the map be ours. And then somewhere like, oh, I don't know, Belgium, like they have a country, right? Um, maybe the Basque were going to fight harder because they're trying to have their own spot. But how much, how much did something like that for the Poles and the other really ferocious resistance, how, how much of that was driven by something like we have a chance to have a nation right now? Let's take an opportunity to make something more out of this situation. Well, the Poles were very much, they had a long tradition of uprisings against the occupiers and only having 20 years of restoration of independence where patriotism had been driven to such a height that it's very difficult to comprehend nowadays just yeah. how patriotic people were. Um, so they were ready to run the risk and they were looking back to the history of the 1863 uprising, the 1830 uprising, you know, that they were going to be the generation who had to rise up again. Again, the Belgians look back to the First World War when most of the country had been occupied and the same people who'd run intelligence networks then started running them again. The inspiration of the British nurse, Edith Cavell, who was executed by the Germans for um, helping Allied soldiers escape, um, inspired other nurses to start their own escape line in the Second World War. But you know, countries like Norway and the Netherlands, which had not been occupied for over a century, um, they had absolutely no idea how to resist <laughs> right? The yeah. of the, the psyche. And so it took them time to work out what they could do and how they could do it. Ah, boy, that's no, man, no manual for resistance. You have to work it out yourself. Right. Yeah, that's great. I'm so glad that uh, we got a chance to cover that because it, it is interesting to me. Like, there's a thing that we have and. and like I put my American self in there, like where there's the Alan of the American free soldier who fights the, you know, the Soviet conscript, you know, and you're like, yeah, you know, or whatever, the the Nazi guy who's pulled out of a camp, I'm like you're going to go fight. But, but really there is something to that where you're fighting for something more than just yourself. And, and it tends to push people in these instances, I guess to doing more than they might and accomplishing something in the face of, of lethal danger. Well, I mean, the, the quote that I end my book with was, you know, yes. that they resisted so that they could look and an allied soldier in the face and say, I resisted. Yeah. You yeah. know, it, it was the pride that they needed. Yeah. You, uh, I'm going to wrap this up real quick. You've written this fantastic book. There must be a million pages of source material that you have to go. And I mean, literally a million, but there, you only get a thousand to tell. And a thousand's a lot to <laughs> tell this story. Is there more work to do here? Is there a whole nother book on the Asian side of the resistance? Well, the, the Asian side is certainly very, uh, it has to be considered separately. The Pacific Wars. Uh, right. Uh, the Far East was very different. Um, and I think what needs to be done more is that some countries have looked quite closely at who resisted, you know, the types of people. Um, but that is very patchy evidence. And it's mm -hmm. been distorted by political, um, post-war political connotations. So that needs to be looked at. Mm -hmm. 
some works have been done at the local level it needs to be brought up more more local areas to give a better national picture and also the role of foreigners i mean for instance spanish republicans were very active resistors in france but again i couldn't you know, concentrate on them the poles yeah. actually as forced laborers that uh, tipped up in many countries uh, and they're always ready to help out with the resistance there yeah yeah it's uh it's it's well, look it's a fantastic book it taught me so much about what I don't know still and then about what was possible to know understand about this it was just I really really enjoyed it um so thank you for writing that what's next for you now that you've got this small book out of the way what's uh, what's next for for Halleck well I mean at the moment I don't know whether it will build up to a book but I'm looking at the fate of Allied, well, British and American civilians and Canadian civilians who were trapped in Europe during the Second World War. Oh, okay. Some were yeah. interned, some lived freely. How did they cope? Uh, and you know, th this brings out, you know, the whole country. You know, how, um, you know, how should Britain and the United States respond to some of their civilians being trapped? You know, yeah. How they they can help? I don't know if it will come into a book, but it's fun. It's a lot mm. of human stories. And after two weighty tragedies, I'm looking for one that's sort of, <laughs> it's still an important story, I think. It's yeah. still absolutely fascinating, um, but it's certainly lighter. Um, it should be in theory to, 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 to write. No, I'm just having a lot of fun on that. And yeah. I hope it will become a book, but you know, I can't yeah, who knows, right? Yeah. It is it is remarkable. I mean, you get to put your hand, and so many of you guys who do this great research, you get the log books, you get to read the letters, and it must just be emotionally heavy, whether it's love or happiness or grinding misery, you know, as people are pouring their heart out, potentially for the last time in their life. So they're really writing from a rich emotional state. That must be a lot for you to have to go through. Oh yeah, I mean that there, there is an emotional impact in, in what you're reading. I mean, you know, I was talking about you know, moral responsibility for resistance. Yeah. I mean, you read the debates they had in the ghettos in Poland and the occupied Soviet Union about you know should we rise up, knowing that the Germans will then wipe out the entire ghetto or not? Yeah. Um, I mean, those are particularly because it's a captive population. Those are particularly intense debates. Yeah. Very, very yeah. painful um, to read. It would be great to have a, a similar story and have it be about love on all of the love that was created and the marriages and the babies and the, the good stuff. You know, no, it's it's all a lot of humor. I mean, I did, do put in some of the humor, you know, it's just the yeah. joy of life, you know. Why not take a gramophone up to the top of a high building in Copenhagen and blare out? It's a long oh, way right. to temporary. I mean, why not? Why not? <laughs> <You> <laughs> <laughs> Lots of things like that happened. Well, listen, I don't want to take any more of your time. You've been super generous. Anytime you want to come on the show, I'd love to talk about it. I've got to read this book several more times. And everybody else, you guys should read this book. Let me put the link up here so you all can see it. It's called Resistance. I listened to it on Audible, but however you – that's not the right one. Um, however you listen to it on Audible or you read it, whatever it is, get it. It's so good. It's so interesting. You're going to you're going to have to read it several times because there's just so much stuff. There's all these names. How what a fantastic book! Thank you so much for writing it. Anything in closing that you want to say? Um, nope. I, th I think we've we've had a very interesting talk. So thank you for inviting me on your show. Yes, you're welcome. Stand by. I'm going to shut this thing down. I'll be right back to you. Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here are the next episodes you should listen to, curated by yours truly. Thank you.